Often, when contemplating a new video, deciding where to start feels a bit like jumping on a merry-go-round. So let's start this one by taking a quick peek at the finished decoder. Okay, now that we know where we're going, let's talk about what it takes to get there. For hardware, we'll need a 3.5 inch TFT touchscreen display, more about that later, a GY Max 4466 mic board, an APA 106 F8 LED, an STM32 Blue Pill processor board, and to wire everything together, we'll need 22 female to female jumpers, each 10 centimeters long. As shown here, I use double sided sticky tape to hold everything together. So, other than maybe having to solder some header strips to their respective boards, there's no soldering, grinding, or drilling required. All parts can be had via eBay or AliExpress for a total project cost of approximately $16 US. Links to suppliers that offer compatible parts can be found in the video description below. But now, let me take a moment to point out some potholes. Suppliers come and go as do what they have to offer. So, when shopping for the display, be aware that there are many, many variants that from the display side look pretty much identical to what's used here. But when it comes to wiring them up, they have totally different electrical needs. This project uses the MCU Friend KBV library. So be sure to conform, confirm that the back side of your display has the same pin configuration as what's shown here. The same point can be made for the microphone board. Make sure your unit has three pins, uses the MAX4466 chip, and confirm that the board's output pin is DC bias to the midpoint of the 3.3 volt supply. On the software side, we're using the Adreno's IDE to transform the STM32 into a CW decoder. But first, if you've never worked with the STM32 Blue Pill, let me recommend you invest another $2.35 on an ST-Link V2 programming dongle. Including shipping, my total cost for this item was $3.03. And yes, it's true that the Blue Pill can be programmed with an FTDI serial adapter that some of you may already own. In my opinion, the extra expense of the dongle versus time saved is money well spent. And again, if you're new to the STM32 and or the Adreno IDE, I'd also recommend before proceeding further, you take a few minutes and use the IDE to load the Blinky sketch onto the STM32. Regardless, before you can do any programming, the IDE needs to be set up to work with the STM32 family. So, in the IDE, use the File Preferences menu option to gain access to the additional Boards Manager's URLs and add the Dan Drown org URL. It's essential that you use this URL when working with sketches contained in this project. Using another URL will likely result in compile errors or a binary that exceeds the Blue Pill's 64K flash memory. Once the URL is in place, you then use the Tools Board menu option to open the Boards Manager by navigating up to the top of the listing box. Then, to filter the list, set the Type drop-down control to Contributed and or enter STMF, STM32F into the search box to further refine the pick list. Then, in the list area, look for STM32F1XX slash GDFF1XX. When you have it located, click on its install button. 
For the record, I'm using version 2020.2.18 to make this video. Now assuming you have this installed, the next step is to relaunch the Tools Board menu option and this time navigate down to f and find select the board setting to read generic STM 32F103C series. With that selected, proceed on down and select set the variant to STM 32F103C8. Upload method to ST-Link and finally confirm that CPU speed is 72 megahertz. Optimize is set to smallest. Again, let me stress to be successful, this group of settings needs to match what's shown here. I'm not going any deeper in how to use the IDE to program blue pill boards, but rather encourage you to check out one or more videos out there that will walk you through the general process. They will do it as well or better than I can, and most will use the blinky sketch referred to earlier in this as their example sketch. One point to note though, many of these videos use an FTDI as the transfer link. Ignore those references and instead connect the ST link to the four end pins on the blue pill board. Pay close attention here to where the ground and 3.3 volt pins are on each of the two units. For some reason, their pin order is not the same. What I did once satisfied that I had the jumpers interconnected correctly was superglue the jumper sockets to themselves. This preserves the order and helps assure that I get it right time after time. Another thing to note with the ST-Link interface is you don't fool with shifting the onboard programming jumper back and forth as required with the FTDI interface. And finally, for the Linux folks watching, the project's GitHub site has a special folder for you that includes a file that enables USB recognition of the ST-Link dongle plus a README that explains where on your hard drive this file needs to be placed. Once comfortable with the Blinky program, the next step is to use the project's connection diagram to install the 15 jumpers that run from the blue pill to the display. Again, like the other resources unique to this project, the GitHub link contains a PDF version of the connection diagram. Look for it in the Documents folder. Note, the color of the jumpers shown on this diagram mean nothing. These colors were chosen solely for contrast between the board's colors and the jumper runs. Note, too, that many of the connections between the blue pill and the display are bus-like runs, so it's possible to peel off a ribbon of jumpers and connect them as a group between the blue pill and the display. Now, with the display, with the display connections in place, we'll, make a small, we'll take a small detour and load the blue pill TFT clock sketch. Find it in the GitHub's Adreno folder. Because I'm hoping that some of you are doing this for the first time, let me take a moment and talk about how to move files from GitHub to where they can be used on your computer. And since we're talking about sketches, let's use this sketch as our example. First, find the GitHub hyperlink in the video description. Click on it or copy it to your browser to take you to the repository. Now, at the GitHub web page, find and click the clone or download button and then click on the download zip option. The download process will start and after a few seconds or minutes depending on your network a zip copy of this repository will be in your downloads folder. Now we come to a critical step. We need to find the folder that has the sketch name blue pill TFT clock and copy extract this folder to your computer's Arduino folder. Assuming the IDE has been installed with default settings, in Windows this Arduino folder will be located inside your Documents folder, and for the Linux user, users, it's inside your Home folder. Now back to our project. 
The Blue Pill TFT clock sketch is a modified example sketch. Running it successfully will confirm your display connections are correct and give us driver info that you will need later to set up the CW decoder sketch. But before the clock sketch can be compiled, we need to add two libraries to your IDE. They are the Adafruit GFX library and the, M and the MCU Friend KBV library mentioned earlier. If you've not already installed them, then in the IDE use the Tools Manage Libraries menu option to open the Library Manager. The Library Manager is structured much like the Board Manager, so you'll navigate and select these libraries in much the same way as we did selecting the Board. So, in the Search Filter box, type Adafruit underscore GFX or MCU friend underscore KBV and finally when the respective library appears in the pick list click on the entries install button. If needed there's a more detailed explanation of this process at the learn.adafruit link found in the description. Once both libraries have been installed you should be good to compile and load this example sketch and here's what you should see. Take note of the ID value reported particularly if it's not 9486 because if it isn't you'll need to modify the decoder sketches ID value to match what you actually have. Now we can power down the STM32 and install the remaining six jumpers needed to connect the STM32 to the LED and microphone board. To help with connecting the LED there's a photo of it in the GitHub's document folder. Like I did on the blue pill side of the ST link jumpers I superglued these socket connectors so that the LED and mic board can be plugged and unplugged as single connections. And finally install the last connection needed from pin A8 to A9. Once satisfied that all components are properly interconnected, interconnected, you can move on to loading the decoder sketch. Like we did the clock sketch, move the decoder sketch to your computer's Adreno folder. Sharp-eyed builders will notice that this time we're moving more than a folder with a single file. That's because the decoder program uses libraries that are unique to the hardware and wiring combination we have here. Open the sketch in the Adreno's IDE by using the File Open menu option and find its folder in the listing. Double click the folder folder name, select the sketches INO file and then to open this sketch click the open button or double click the file. With the sketch open, and if earlier you got an ID other than 9486, find the line ID equal, which at the time of this video was line 1096, and change it to match the value found with the clock sketch. Now you can compile and load the sketch. When the process completes, the display will be transformed from a clock to a CW coder. And because it's open source, feel free to modify it to better suit your needs. But before go you go changing things, let's take a deeper look at what you get with a stock sketch. We'll start by taking a look at the user interface, and perhaps understanding the role of the LED should come first in this group. Let's watch how it behaves in the presence of a variable tone generator while I change the frequency from 650 to approximately 850 Hertz. Although the camera doesn't respond well to the LED colors, what I hope you can make out is when the microphone receives a tone of less than 750 Hertz, the LED color is red. Conversely, when it's above this center frequency, the color is blue, and finally, it's green when the tone is within 20 hertz of the center frequency. Also, the LED's brightness varies with volume to the point when the level becomes excessive, the LED glows white. 
So, effectively, the LED is a visual tuning indicator, and with some practice, the user can quickly discern what receiver adjustments are needed for the decoder to accurately track the sender's keying signal. Now, let's turn our attention to the touchscreen display. The top 80% is reserved for decoding. It can show up to 11 40 character lines of text. While technically the entire screen is touch sensitive, this area has been programmed not to react to user input. But the bottom 20% of the display will. Here there are three touch zones. The first, the left side, can by touch be switched between showing the current words per minute and waiting ratio to showing the average duration in milliseconds of the dits, DAWs, and space intervals. Next, the blue box acts as a decoder reset. Touching this box will erase the contents of the text area and restore the program to its default startup values used for 15 words per minute decoding. The last area, the green box, lets the user cycle through three decoding modes. It basically changes the timing used to determine dits, DAWs, and letter breaks. For 95% of the code found on the air, the norm mode will yield the best results. But for certain senders, the other two options may decode better. This last segment is an under the hood look of the processor in action. The blue pill is actually running two programs. The first is a tone sensing program which is a modified Gertzel routine with timing coefficients set to respond to a center frequency of 750 Hz. It samples the mic output at a sample rate just north of 10 kHz. And once it's collected the equivalent of six cycles of 750 Hz sound, it compares it to the average sound energy to determine the presence of a keying tone. If a tone is present, the routine sets pin A9 low, and as we saw earlier, it sends color values that are proportional to the tone's relative strength and frequency to the LED. The second program responds to hardware interrupts on pin A8, which by the connection diagram is jumper to A9. Its job is to take these high-low signals and decide if the low intervals represent a dit or a DAW. Now, the Adreno IDE has a plot option found under the Tools menu. We can use the USB serial port as a pathway to send data from the blue pill to this tool. In this instance, we are watching what's happening to various key variables in the two programs as audio gets processed for conversion to decoded characters. When something interesting happens, you can use the print scheme screen key to take a snapshot of it and then by pasting this screenshot into an app like paint we can study in more detail what happened just before and after the event so i'll close this video with a quick description of the traces contained in this plot above the zero line we have six traces they are the orange trace representing the magnitude of the gertzel algorithm the red blue and green traces are the long-term average magnitudes of the low, high, and center frequency components taken from this algorithm. The purple trace represents the noise magnitude, and the gray trace is the current squelch value. And below the zero line, we have the aqua and black traces. The aqua trace represents key state, with high being key close condition, and the black trace shows letter break timing where the low to high transition indicates it's time to decode the accumulated dits and DAWs. Having this tool has been invaluable in gaining an understanding of why some signals fail to translate correctly. Finally, I hope this video has increased your interest in understanding in some area of what we've covered here. And as always, thanks for watching and good luck with your next project.